thank you for tuning in to Tamara for Georgia. I am Tamara Johnson Sheely, your candidate for the United States Senate. I'm an independent Democrat that believes that reparations will make America great. It is time that we unite our country once and for all. Please go to my website. It's TamaraForGeorgia.com. And please join me every Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here for Tamara for Georgia. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, Saturday morning here in Georgia, y'all. It is a little gloomy, but we are here and we are in the house. We're going to have a great conversation this morning. I have a guest with me, y'all, and we're going to talk about food. We're going to talk about what we're eating, what we're putting in our bodies in the midst of this pandemic, y'all. We need to talk about food, fueling our bodies, fueling our souls. I have a great guest with me this morning, Miss Sarah. Let's see where she is. Good morning. Morning. How are you? I'm all right. I'm having my coffee and trying to wake up and pop up for you. Yes. So y'all, everybody, Sarah is all the way in California, <laughs> all the way on the West Coast. It is quite early over there. So we just have to say thank you to Sarah for joining us on this Saturday morning. <laughs> Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. <laughs> all right. And we got Tulsa in the house. Universal Mike, he is always what? First. <laughs> 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 says hey Sarah good morning good morning so let me tell you guys how Sarah and I met I spent a lot of time on the clubhouse app and the every y'all all know I'm running for the U.S. Senate and I am very very interested in food Georgia is an agriculture state and you know, I like to eat. <laughs> and when I grow up, when I grow up, y'all, I really want to have a farm. Like I want to learn to garden. I want to learn to do all this. I want to be able to grow my own food. It's something that my grandmother, I, I've told this story before as a little girl, it was such a treat, Sarah, to go to the gas station and get a bag of chips and soda because literally we ate out of the yard. Like whatever was growing in the yard is what we ate. So I grew up and that was my that was my normal. Um, so, you know, nowadays people, you know, process foods and what we're putting in our bodies. I don't think a lot of people even read labels or even understand what is happening. You know, we don't know what's going on. But in the midst of this new world that we're now in, we, in this pandemic, we have to be mindful that health, our health is our, you know, is your responsibility. I can't rely on governments to keep me healthy and keep me safe i have to do that for myself so i spent a lot of time on the clubhouse app but in the agriculture room and asking a lot of probably like elementary questions but i don't know so i figured i'd i'd ask so sarah i'll let you introduce yourself <laughs> ayuki my name is sarah and i'm a Karuk tribal member from Northern California, and I do work in, in indigenous food spaces here in California. And I just finished writing a book about using our traditional foods in modern kitchens. And <laughs> I was on the Clubhouse app with you as well, listening to the same agriculture room. And I heard your question, and it was it, it was a question that I know for a fact so many people ask and don't and and are you know wondering how to you know interpret these labels and you know what is it that I'm eating and and how do I make a decision based on my values and what I need for my body and I I heard the answer that was coming and I and I reached out because I I knew that there would be uh, it would be go it would be answered through the lens of uh, U.S. agriculture uh, industry lens rather than just the real 
real information that you needed to make a decision. So I don't know. Indigenous. See, there's a difference in the answers that I were, was getting in the room and the answers that I've gotten from you, because it does come from, um, you know, respectfully, it just it's a corporate mindset. It's corporate farming and, you know, a big, big agriculture. But you are someone from the indigenous community, the Karuk tribe. And I actually had a young lady on a few weeks back and she was indigenous as well and black. And if we look at you, we see that you are very pale. <laughs> like you are not like brown, like we would think indigenous people are. Mm -hmm. So I've looked up your tribe. I'm gonna share my screen here because I just want people to see. Let me um, share screen. Share my screen. I just want people to see how, you know, inside of this Karuk tribe, and you can tell us where, where you guys are like really located, but I just wanted people to see the council, the tribal council, and how, you know, we, we look at people and we tend to think, well, are they, what are they? You know, and you can't tell. You can't tell. Like looking at you, I would have never thought that you were indigenous. But even when I look through like your tri the tribe, like she she looks black or Latina. <laughs> she looked like I'm like, OK, I would have th thought maybe Asian, you know, just guessing. And, you know, you just can't tell. So speak to that indigenous, the, the indigenous community. And then, you know, tell us more about how eating is so, you know, it is it is fundamental to who you are as a nation and as a people. Yeah, well, you know, due to colonization, we we are on a color rainbow. <laughs> the spectrum it, like black people, we're yeah. light, we're light, damn right. near white and and mm -hmm. dark chocolate. <laughs> yes. So and th so that that's just I guess this is just my my draw on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Genetic draw. So um and and yeah and like you said, there's, you know, it's been colonization has affected us all in different ways and different waves even of colonization. So yeah, it's really difficult to tell who looks like who and, you know, so yeah. Um, and, but the work that I do in my communities is primarily based on our traditional foods like acorns and salmon. The Karuk tribe is on the on the Klamath River and it is a large, it used to be a large salmon producing river in Northern California. And due to dams and agricultural water diversions, there is not very much water left in the Klamath, even though it used to be the third largest salmon producing river in the United States. So it was it was a major river and, and it was something that we relied on for subsistence. And now that it has been mainly choked off and there's some issues with algae and uh, low water, and we're still fighting with farmers up at the top of the Klamath and uh, to, to retain our original water rights, it's, it's a mess. So um, trying to help our communities reclaim our foodways and there's, you know, also an element of activism in that as well. So. And you know what I think about is that pipeline. And there was a pipeline that was coming through like um, one of the tribes in like Colorado, I believe. I'm, I might be wrong, but I just remember how the, the indigenous community were like, no. And they just like fought and they, they protested. And, you know, it's just the, the things that they do to, you know, why? <laughs> why yeah. why are we doing these things? Why are we destroying these native lands? Why are we destroying our food source? Uh money. Money it all it is all a way to to convert resources to dollars, essentially. Uh, and that is like settler colonialism. Like that's the playbook is it's all about resource extraction mm -hmm. and converting that into wealth. So for certain people. <laughs> And, yeah. the, and to hell with the rest of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Acorns and, and salmon and, you know, that that's in, native to your people. Bison, is, is that 
No, we are not. We that's more of a, a plains uh, food way, mm -hmm. traditional food way. But uh, in California, we have a wide variety of indigenous foods. I always say that our foods are the bougiest foods because you find <laughs> them in all of the like fancy restaurants, the Michelin restaurants all are carrying our foods, like our, our mushrooms. We have um, a wide variety of, of morels and chanterelles and porcini and all of those, you know, and, and matsutake mushrooms and all of these really wonderful mushrooms. We have uh, seafood and shellfish like abalone and oysters, quail, quail eggs, and uh, yeah, just all of the bougiest foods that are our traditional foods here in California. So we did have a very wide uh, variety in our diet, a really vibrant and colorful and uh, exciting diet, I think. So. So decolonizing our diets, like you wrote that in on your website. And I found mm -hmm. that to be like, OK, where is she going? What is the big picture? How, what is decolonizing our diets? Yeah, because I can tell you for me as a black woman growing up in the South. Um, and I think I, I've told you this story is like I'm very intentional about what I eat now because I remember as a little girl when I would eat like, and I love macaroni and cheese. Like I love, but cheese and I, <laughs> we don't get along well at all. <laughs> right. So it's certain foods that I realize that I can't, I don't digest well. And I used to like to drink dairy milk, cow milk. And as I got into my later in my late teens, I realized I can't drink this. I can't, I stopped my I, I was having issues, but I didn't understand what was happening with my body and cow's milk and dairy and cheese. So I realized that I have to be mindful of what I eat. So I stopped eating um, pork when I was 16 and I stopped eating beef when I was 21. So I only eat uh, fish, chicken, turkey. That's kind of the, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> so decolonizing our diet what does that mean to you in the indigenous community? Like, or, or just in general, where, where did this come from? Well, I did not invent this term. So this was, this has been um, a movement going on for a while now uh, in indigenous communities. And it, it can mean a lot of different things uh, and also on a spectrum. So beginning decolonization with your diet is, is really also about reclaiming traditional food ways. And I, so in the work that I do, because our communities have, um, have been reliant upon commodity foods, which are, you know, the white flour, lard, and, you know, canned spam and, and things like that, that were the government commodity foods, uh, government cheese. <laughs> I'm sure everybody's probably familiar with with that. And because of our, our communities were separated from our lands purposefully and, and then they, you know, they fed us these boxes of commodity foods. So my work is really about how do you start? How do you start? What's the first steps that you can take to begin to reclaim your traditional foodways and to reconnect to those natural rhythms outside? you know, um, like I, like an oak tree, for an example, there's, it has, it has a rhythm inside of a rhythm. It's the, you know, it's regular life cycle, but then you'll have maybe even a mast year, which you'll have a way more acorns. It'll produce way more acorns in one year than it usually does. So once you begin to reaccess these rhythms and begin to reconnect to it, and learn these food ways about how you uh, tend your oak tree and how you take care of it and then how you leach your acorns and how you preserve them. And then after you've done all of that and you begin to, you know, you've got uh, done all of this and you have this acorn flower now 
now you're like, what do I do with it? <laughs> so that's where my work has been coming in is to help people begin to gradually incorporate these foods into their everyday lives so that they become second nature and then their palates also become reaccustomed to these different textures and flavors like bitterness and, and things like that that we aren't necessarily used to. So, um, for example, if somebody has gone through all of this, you know, they find that they're connecting, they've gone through all of this, they've leached their acorns, they've dried the acorns, they've got the acorns into flour, I will come in with some recipes for something that they can easily incorporate into their everyday life. Even if it's just a muffin recipe, their kids can do it or, you know, waffles or whatever, some sort of way to incorporate this for a more modern palate, because it is a really difficult sell to get teenagers to eat acorn soup every single day because it, it has a very earthy and, you know, kind of a, a very different flavor than they're used to. So beginning to gradually incorporate that, especially as your children are younger, is uh is what I'm hoping that we can help people do. Wow. So when I think about acorn, look, I, I know that the squirrels eat nuts, <laughs> <laughs> but I never, you know, I, I just, it's not my diet. I, and I wouldn't know, but I didn't know that there was a such thing as acorn flour. So you are taking the, the acorns mm -hmm. making flour and, and that is, traditional eating that's true that's that's a traditional diet for the indigenous community i never heard that i didn't you know i when i think about the acorns i'm thinking the squirrels eating the nuts i didn't think that we were actually eating the acorns as well yeah they so acorns are they are a really incredible food they're complete food and they have fats carbohydrates they and protein they're a great food the they do require processing because of they they have a lot of tannins and tannins are similar to if you drink wine they you you get that kind of like puckering type of like tannic taste in wine it's very similar except highly concentrated in the acorns and in my tribe we we prefer uh, tan oak acorns and the tan oak acorns are so full of tannins that we can actually tan um deer skin with the tannins from the tan oak acorns. So when you've got the acorns, you've mushed them all up and you put them in water, all of this yellow water will come out. And those are the tannins that are leaching out of the acorn. And that tannin water can be used to tan, you know, deer skin or animal hides and stuff traditionally. And when you say tan it, you mean like it gives it flavor? No, it means, it's, <laughs> have you heard of the term of tanning hides? No. Oh, okay. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of making the leather soft and pliable and wearable. So the, the tannins make the, the leather soft, pliable, and wearable and cures it. So it, it, okay. it can be like worn or used. Mm -hmm. You're talking to somebody who knows absolutely nothing about decolonizing our diets. <laughs> Right. And let me ask you, when you said reclaiming um, this, these traditions, has a lot of it been forgotten? And where did you find your recipes? Like, how did you like tap back into what is might might be lost for the most part? Mm -hmm. So that's complicated because it's different for everybody. And and but, you know colonization is what it all comes down to really in, in our, in our disconnection from our food ways and in multiple waves, waves of disconnection and disconnecting the people from the food and the people from their land is, you know, it is, is colonizing is how they have moved in and, and colonized our land. So, and even in the anthropological records that we have, because especially here in California, we have some anthropological records that of um, anthropologists that were going even up to my tribe, and the, they weren't they were up there to document and you know to 
write and write about in a, in an academic way, write about native peoples of California. But even then, because our foods were not that exciting or there wasn't any level of like brutality or savagery or anything exciting in that, in, in, it was considered women's work. They didn't really document much about our food ways. So even when we're trying to reclaim from an anthropological record, it's still difficult because those things were not considered exciting enough to be documented. So a lot of it is is still handed down through our elders and e- you know and even then I mean a lot has 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 been lost because of our boarding school disconnections and um, genocide. So uh, in my reclamation of this, I I grew up in Hoopa, which is a, a reservation in Northern California adjacent to my traditional lands. And I was fortunate to grow up inside that community. So uh, for me, my child, like I, the reason I really started this journey was because of my own children, because they don't, they haven't grown up on the res, so they don't have the same kind of identity or connection to it. And I really wanted them to, to be able to feel that. And, you know, we go back. And, but it's not the same. So I wanted them to be able to feel that and to participate and to pass on our traditional food ways that I knew to them. So in that, I realized that teenagers don't like acorn soup every day. So I started developing all of these recipes on my own for them. And I began writing um, a column in News from Native California with some of the recipes that I had developed for them and just our family recipes that that we made. And they asked if I would be interested in writing a book based on that column. So my book is a lot of recipes that use traditional foods in hopefully in really accessible and, and vibrant ways. So just because I know that our diets you know, even though we don't know very much necessarily in specifics about them, because of all of the foods that are out there. And, you know, as mom, I know that our foods had to be vibrant and they had to be, you know, I know what it's like feeding children. And even back then, I can only imagine that moms were creative and they had creative ideas and each one probably had their own way of doing it for their own children. And even when I talk to my elders, they do have some, they have, they have uh, memories of their grandmothers making them acorn soup and they had different ways of doing it even in just in with in different families of making the same dish, different ways of doing it and different ways that they knew that their children and grandchildren would prefer to eat it. So I know that there was some, there was a vibrant and varied diet. And I wanted to try to reflect that in, in my own recipes. So that's why I really wrote the book. (laughs) So yeah. It sounds like potato salad in the black community, like potato salad in the black community. Everybody makes their potato salad different. (laughs) Like there's all different, all these different ways. And when my mother passed away, I'm going to tell you, my mom used to make some of the best potato salad. Right. And when she passed away, I was like, oh, my gosh, I wish that I had learned how to make her potato salad. And I remember like having that so heavy on my spirit because I was like, I want my mother's potato salad. And I know this to be true. I know our ancestors still are with us because when I had it so heavy in my spirit, it came to me how to make my mother's potato salad so I can make my mom's potato salad. I love it. When I hear you talk about how you like, you know, listening to the elders and, you know, and and recreating what you couldn't reclaim. Sounds like we you've had to recreate it and, 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 and give it something extra for even your children. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also the thing about, I think indigenous food ways is that they are a holistic way of eating. So Mm -hmm. it's, you know, you have, it's all about relationships and you have relationship with your, with where you're gathering, you have a relationship with your community and it's, 
there's there are so many elements that make up the circle of a food way. There's storytelling, art. There's basketry. There's you know tools, and it, it's it's so many different things in one. That one bowl of like, or even just one acorn muffin that I would make has you know I it has so much inside of it. There's the story of you know, like our, our acorn maidens or going out and with my sons, the memory of going out with my sons to gather acorns and, you know, those just all of that in this muffin. And so when we're eating it, it's an, it, we have this opportunity to reflect on that and, and connect even further with each other. And it's, I think that is what I, what is the most special about indigenous foodways is that it's it is a it's complete for your soul like that's how it feels it's a it's a soul's completion but um and also i i also think it's really makes it accessible for people because even if you are never able to pick up an acorn in your life if you're if you're a karuk person and you're nowhere near your traditional lands and you can't necessarily gather acorns you can still participate in storytelling you can participate in in a variety of different ways and you can still participate by you know um by practicing this like the reciprocity of the land around you so i, I think that's really cool Oh, yes, it is. When, I, when, you, when you said that, it made me think of how, you know, food is not just nourishment for your body. Mm -hmm. You said it. It's like nourishment for your soul. This is how we connect. And when we were colonized <laughs> and we were enslaved, uh, you know, separating us from our foods, from our lands, it destroyed us as, as peoples, like, right? Like, mm -hmm. it totally destroyed us. Not totally. Not totally. You're right. Because we've held on, right? Mm -hmm. We've held on. Yep. So held on long enough that our children are going to be able to reclaim things that our parents and our grandparents clung to, you know, to, to save for us. So, yeah. And, and, you know, there, there is a lot there to be said about what happens to uh you know your you know your psyche and your emotional health when you're disconnected from the land and and when you consider yourself a part of it and there's no separation between you and the land until something comes along and separates you and severs you from that um you know that relationship and that connection and you know, just the feeling untethered and not sure what to do. And, and can, it can cause a lot of, you know, intercommunity like trauma. So, yeah. So how do we, how do we get it back? Like, so what are, so tell us what you're doing and how, how are we getting all of this back? I think that it can feel really overwhelming if you think about how am I going to get all of this back all at once, but it, just to do one thing, just one thing, pick one thing that is, that is interesting to you. That is, you know, whether it's an acorn or um, in the back, you might see like the trees and behind me, and those are all bay laurel trees and they can, they have pepper nuts, which that was, I mean, the, the pepper nuts that fall, there are the nuts from the bay laurel tree. I mean, just look around you and find one thing and just pay attention to it for a year and just watch it and see what its cycle is. What is it doing? Just watch it for a year. And it's, you know, you'll, you, I don't know, you, you begin to like access a rhythm once you start to do that, once you start to pay attention Do the robins come you know, do it. what time of the year are they there? And, you know, just noticing things around you is a good first step. And, um, you know, when it comes to food, yeah, just one thing and learn all there is to know about this one thing and then move on and just grow from there. Learn about its history and stories, art, whatever it is. You know, just I would say just pick one thing, even if it's um, a stinging nettle patch or something like that um, there and whatever is around you and learn everything there is to know 
about so we, that one thing. We, we have a question. She said, mm -hmm. can we talk a little bit about herbs? Yes, yes. So here's what I've done. I am, I have a bay window in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that one thing, I love cilantro. I don't even know why I started liking it, but I love the flavor of cilantro. So I had some seeds. I, pl I planted them and they are, I planted them like right at Christmas and they're sprouting. And I'm like, I am so excited about just, I don't know when I'm going to be able to eat them. I think it takes like seven, 60, 70 days, but this is, was at Christmas. So we're like halfway there and they look so good, so healthy. I can't wait to start like snipping off some of the leaves and put it on my salad. So let's talk about herbs. I, I do want to do more. So are there any herbs that we should, we could tap into? Like, yeah, I mean, there's, there are, there's a lot like of indigenous herbs. Is that what you mean? Or going out or growing your own? I mean, you can grow your herbs in your house in a little box in your window like that. Mm -hmm. and, and they grow quickly and they're one of the easiest things that you can grow and eat fresh. And that's also something that you can control. You know, what's going in, you know, you know what, what it is. So, um, but out, outside, I mean, there's like wild onions and wild garlic. There's wild ginger, wild mustard. There's fennel, fennel pollen. I use a lot of fennel pollen, which is actually a non-native species that um, was here from Italy. But it's everywhere in California, all over the place. And it has these big yellow flowers. And the pollen inside it tastes just like, I don't know, like you would like an Italian kind of flavor. A, a fennel. So, uh, yeah. Is, is that what you mean? Like, um, in an indigenous way, or do you mean from, uh, just a personal grow in a garden kind of way? Because I do think everybody should try to grow a little garden if they can mm -hmm. and start with herbs. Herbs is the perfect place to start and lettuces. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try lettuce next. Um, um, they're so easy. Yeah. Yeah, I look for. He says, "What does this mean for people in other regions?" This is a question that was from earlier. He says, "Where do where do we get this food? Like where you know, we you and I were talking about how you know. I always I look at Georgia. I get excited about agriculture in Georgia. I'm really getting to know my farmers, mm -hmm. um, listening to them. What are their concerns? Because Georgia to me is the perfect place. I know we can grow. You know, we we grew we grew cotton. You and I actually talked about this. How cotton was king here in Georgia. But Georgia is so prime and ripe for vegetables and fruits. Mm -hmm. I mean, the weather is conducive to having more than just textile. Like, or I know hemp is big right now. But what about food? And I want to see Georgia. I really want to see Georgia beyond pecans and peanuts. I believe we can do so much more with the land, and we have an, a, we have so much land to to do that with. Mm -hmm. So. As a Californian, I would love to see Georgia grow more food <laughs> because the food amount of food that we're producing in California is really stressing out our natural, our natural resources. And it is, it is very stressful, uh, especially because of our limited, I mean, because of the water, you know, the, the, the way that water is used in this state and mis mishandled mm -hmm. the way that the fresh water is diverted to agriculture in such an enormous quantity. And it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty frustrating, um, from my standpoint, because I mean, especially in, in, in my particular region where, you know, we've got this really big, amazing, bountiful, potentially bountiful river full of salmon that could provide more nutrition in one spring salmon run than all of the farmers at the top of the Klamath could hope to provide in a lifetime of growing alfalfa and horseradish. So it's very frustrating to see that the water is going to that particular use instead of into the river with salmon where we could be really, um, really, uh, bolstering a, a more robust salmon and, you know, nutritious food option. So yeah, I would love to see Georgia growing more, more fruits and vegetables over there. It's perfect. You have an abundance of rainfall and abundance of sunshine. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Yeah, it would be great. So hopefully, and that's something in the future that we can see some of that agriculture pressure taken off of California and uh, moved and spread out throughout the United States. It'd be 
really great. Yeah. These Southern states are, you know, we could do so much more. And I see like when I traveled around Georgia, as I, as a candidate, as I travel around Georgia, I mean, it's just acres and acres and acres of just undeveloped land that we could totally, totally farm and we could feed America. We could, feed, like you say, take some of the pressure off of California and some of these other states where you are mm-hmm. trying to free, feed all of us when we could be helping. Yeah, I will be. It would be really great. <laughs> it would be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Talk about the the salmon a, a little bit further because I think a lot of people don't understand that that's that life cycle of how you you were talking about how they're they have these kind of like farms salmon farms at the top and when we, when we could have something I'm sorry as an ambulance <laughs> passing <laughs> when we could have you know some something more sustainable downstream is what I think I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Sam, we have, there are Sam salmon farms that are um, these big agricultural operations, a lot like you see with the, the cattle and uh, pork industry. Then they have these huge CAFOs of, um, of, of beef and pork. And they do the same thing with salmon and are, they do it uh, in a way with like where, and it has the same issues with this farmed salmon that we have with the pork and the beef in that there's the effluent that runs out and it pollutes the waterways and the aquaculture in the streams. And it's to, they're, they're basically, you know, growing this, they're, <laughs> it's bizarre to be growing a fish next to the ocean basically, and then pumping the wastewater into the ocean where the fish should actually be gathered from. So it, it, it but it's, a, again, a, it's also a response to, you know, consumers needing healthier diets and needing more salmon in their diets and, and more healthy fats and fishes and proteins and more healthy options, even though it is a homogenization of a protein because there's a bajillion kinds of fish and shellfish out there. But for some reason, we are only concentrating on this one fish. And it is frustrating too, because uh, especially where I'm from, where they're thinking of putting in one of these um, uh, fish farms right right next to the, you know, really just like as the crow flies, just a minute from the Klamath River, which used to be the third largest salmon producing river. And instead of restoring and repairing these robust, wild, you know, salmon populations, we're having this, so this, you know, corporation come in and, and put in a uh, farmed salmon operation. And it's, it, I think that that is, that's just been, a, I think, a constant frustration for many years that agriculture, there's a disconnect between how, you know, uh, the land and our food sources. So, Yeah, it sounds disruptive to the food chain and to the food cycle. Like you say, you have these fish farms and mm-hmm. if the fish in the fish, if, if this was being done in nature like it's supposed to be done it's a cycle that mm-hmm. they'll, they'll they'll clean the bottom of the, they'll eat their they'll eat things and they'll clean things and they can produce more it's, it becomes a, a life cycle that is mm-hmm. disruptive and ca- it sounds to be a little counterproductive like you're you're making things worse <laughs> yeah yeah that's that has been my experience with most of us agriculture <laughs> It's not, especially when it's become corporate, you know, and when they're trying to do it on these large scales and the same thing goes with the, you know, pork and, and beef. I mean, the way, like I was talking about before this homogenization of our proteins, there are more than three kinds of meat. There's, we have all of these wild (laughs) stocks out there that are actually needing to be, you know, managed and tended. We've got all kinds of protein, even in California here, we have venison, we have elk, which is really delicious. We've got quail and other game birds and, uh, yeah. And, and, a and an infinite variety of fish and shellfish it in all different times during the year, you know, so we can be eating all of these different kinds of proteins, but instead at the grocery store, you can either have these, you can only have these three things. So I do think that, and I hope for more wild stock 
uh, options in the future. I have been noticing here in California, we've been having more wild stock options in our grocery store, but they're still very expensive and cost prohibitive. But I mean, I can find ground venison, I can find ground bison at the Costco now. So in my area, and also I've found ground elk. And I think it's become more, I think, I think hope I'm hoping that they, the more that they get a toehold in that we can diversify our diets and give people some more options because it isn't, I think that we can tell that it isn't super healthy, that we only have these few options. So the more varied, we all know, like the more varied our diets are, the better and more healthy that we are. Yeah, eating in rotation and seasonally. Yeah. Like, but you know how Americans are. We want it when we want it. It's like right. on demand with this microwave generation now, 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 now. So I think we do, you know, I think in this great reset, this pandemic, I think it has given everybody an opportunity to see, you know, what's important. Let's stop. And we had the world stop. So we had to stop. And now we're like reevaluating everything. Like, okay, do we really need to do? this to the degree that we're doing like we're now reevaluating i think everybody is i know i i have been yeah people have become very introspective and they are also starting to notice things in their homes that maybe they didn't have time to notice before like you were talking about in the that clubhouse room about your label and you had questions about this label like what do all of these things mean and they can be overwhelming and they can be a little scary. And then when you have an industry that that isn't as transparent as it should be with information and it's it becomes really frustrating for a consumer. And they're just kind of, you know, out there making decisions at the grocery store on the fly, you know, thinking that hoping that this is the right thing. And and I mean it's just a lot of work. Even if you like ingest your almond milk that you had, there is so much in just a, a thing of almond milk. And uh, when it comes to labeling, it comes to the environment and political decisions. It's all, it, it is a, it's a whole thing. It's not just, here's your carton of almond milk. <laughs> Our food is, is become very political. And um, yeah, there's just a lot. And there's so many, there's, it's, and it's so like, so changing as well. You just kind of have to be on it all the time in order to stay up with it. So it can be frustrating when you, when you go. When you say food is political, you're right. I realize um, everything, you know, and that's how I got drawn into politics because I got into politics because of my industry. I come from the beauty and barber industry. So I started watching my industry politically and as I started watching my industry politically, my gosh, I start realizing that it was my it was the the air is political. The water is political. The mm -hmm. shoes on your feet is politics, like everything mm -hmm. e that you can't escape the political component of everything in this country. And when I go to the grocery store, even now I'm looking at, you know, I do look at labels. I do look at I'm looking for, G, you know, non GMO products. And I am looking that this is USDA or this is organic. You know, I'm looking for certain things that, mm -hmm. quote unquote, give me some sense of, you know, comfort to know that this this is like, quote, this is the safest food that I could buy. And it's, you know, healthy and safe. And I don't know if that is the case when you see these labels, but it's all that we have to go on, all that I have to go on. Right. Yeah. It, it, right. And I think that is the, I think that is really where the disconnect is, is that there isn't a lot of information or education coming from these agencies, the labeling agencies or the FDA or the USDA there, there isn't, and the ag community itself has, has had a contentious relationship with their consumers and have not historically been transparent and have not felt that they needed to be transparent and that they should just trust, trust me, I'm a farmer. I know what I'm doing. And you city people don't know what you're doing. And oh, that's my coffee. So it, they have, there's been this disconnect that is both, you know, 
from the community itself and from these other agencies, like the or, like organic, like what does that even mean? And is it even better? And now it's become this humongous industry that it's really be, it, it's really become more of an exercise in, in classism than actual, you know, determination of like how things are grown, whether or not they're grown in a healthy way. It's like, because you can have conventionally grown vegetables, but they just cannot afford the certification to be organic. They can be doing everything in, in, a, in a regenerative way, but not necessarily pay the agency that gives them the little sticker that says, this is organic. And the same thing with the GMO project where it, they are paying for this label essentially. So it's, it's very, and, and there's a lot of, you know, there's just a lot of misinformation as well. Like there are a lot of things that say no GMO, you know, but that would have no reason to have a GMO label on it. Of course, it's not a GMO. You won't necessarily have access to those GMOs in your grocery store. Anyway, it's, it's confusing. And, and people think that they're, they're making a good decision and they're trying really, you know, hard to make the right decision and willing to pay more to make a better decision when they don't necessarily need to. And like onions, for example, I said this to you right. um, mm -hmm. the other day that, you know, you don't have to buy onions that are organic. Somebody told me that in the produce department. I'm like, OK, but you wouldn't know that if. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> what I mean. It's really it's really it's really hard. And it helps if you are in a place where you can develop a relationship with the, with the farmers and know. But that's not that's very. um that that's very difficult to do in most places. So because why do organic foods cost more in the grocery store? Because uh, I, for a variety of reasons, I don't want to, I'm for a variety of reasons. One of them is the cost to be certified organic. And um, because you are doing things in a different way, I think it, I think that originally the organic movement was, was about doing things in a healthier way, in a more regenerative way for, you know, the environment, but it kind of has become, uh, it's co kind of, <laughs> yeah, and a little corrupted in that. So it, the reason that they are more expensive is because the certification process is expensive and, um, you know, and also it's just a different way of, of farming, and it can it takes longer sometimes for these life cycles are longer. They're not, you know, um, what am I trying to say? So it might just, they're not, um, they're not using the same amount. Uh, they're not using the same types of fertilizers or whatever. So it might take a longer to grow a carrot than it would to grow a conventional carrot if they're using different, different types of fertilization and fertilizer methods and stuff. So I don't know. So when you say you, you made a comment about classism, how this has become mm -hmm. a movement of classism, break that down a little bit as we have about five more minutes left in the broadcast. That's <laughs> I know that's a big one. That's a big one. Well, it just now at this point, it becomes like organic is healthy, right? It's considered the healthy option. And then there are a lot of families who cannot necessarily afford organic foods. And so it becomes the unhealthy option. But you see like this division, especially here in California, where you've got the like these uh, the grocery stores that like the Whole Foods organic grocery stores in the um more like wealthier white areas. And then in the, and then you've got like different types of grocery stores in other areas that are like, it's there, it becomes a way of dividing people, like what you can afford and what you can't afford. And uh, yeah. So therefore if you can afford organic, then you're like healthier. It's, and it's just kind of a facade. It's not, Real. So they so they could be possibly it sounds like they're 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 really playing a game on us without you know it's it's money like you what you said that earlier it all boils down to the money yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if we can find local farmers you know support your local farmers I yeah. I really try like I really try but you know I'm kind of up in the this part of Georgia but yeah I 
if we can support local farmers, that would be the best thing to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, support local farmers and, you know, um, so I, I would say support land back efforts for Black and Indigenous farmers that are trying to reclaim those uh, foodways. And, uh, and um, you know, it's difficult to get a to get land. Land is expensive and it can be difficult to start a farm. So uh, I know that a lot of indigenous people have started GoFundMes and a lot of uh, other farms have had GoFundMes to help raise money to buy land to begin doing those farms, you know, that kind of farming again. So I would support those efforts as well. Support your local farmers land back efforts, grow your own as much as you can, whatever you can grow in your house and in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. I'm really good. I was, this was a conversation I had in the agriculture space. I'm good with house plants. Like I've gotten, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with my house plants. They grow well, but I have yet, this is my first time growing something that's edible. And I look forward to like tomatoes when the, when it's like that time and cucumbers and definitely lettuce. Like I eat salads, at least four or five times a week. So I definitely should be growing my own lettuce. So yeah. 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 Lettuce is an, a very easy one to grow. And it also is one that is a, is challenging because when you do buy it in the store, it's kind of, you have to wash it really well and it's, yeah. So it'd be best to grow that at home if you can. And if anybody that is watching has any questions that I haven't answered because it's still the morning and my brain is not all the way on its track, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if I don't know the answer, then I will find somebody who does know the answer. So, uh, and, and hopefully it's, it's a real answer that you can, that you can use. And yeah, with, without an agenda behind it, just to, just to give information. No, decolonizing our diets. It's time that we start to get back to what's natural, what's in nature, what, what nature produces when nature produces it. Let's get in this, this rhythm with our food, with our eating, mm -hmm. with our diets. And you made a comment um, about being more colorful, like, you know, eating things that are like, you said something purple and red and orange and <laughs> yeah if you i have an instagram where i i put a lot of my food um food pictures on on there and yeah there's a whole rainbow out there i mean carrots are more than just there's like i mean they should be there are a whole rainbow of colors purple white you know orange yellow there's a, i mean there's a whole rainbow so so yeah and i've seen the stalk of 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 carrots in the grocery store where you can buy like them and they're like purple and and i'm like i don't mm -hmm. know the difference between the purple one and the i just some used to eating the orange one so what is the difference real quick like between the purple one and the orange one yeah they it's just it's a they contain different nutrients so um the when you we want to eat purple foods eating more mm -hmm. purple and blue foods is great lots of antioxidants like what would be blue um, well, there's purple carrots, blueberries, there's uh, purple corn, and uh, purple cauliflower, purple broccoli. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of variety out there, but you don't really see it represented in our grocery stores. Yeah, I, I have seen those purple carrots, though. So now that you've said to eat them, I will be eat and let me ask you the, when I buy the stock with the carrots. I always throw away the the green part, mm -hmm. the leafy part, but they said you can eat that too. Sure. Yeah. I don't eat it personally, but you can also, I, I don't eat it personally, but I don't I, eat it either. I, I haven't even tasted it. So yeah, <laughs> but I can imagine, I, I mean, I, I think if you start to have a garden, then you there are things that you want to put in your garden. And there's also things that you'll find that you'll want to save for your freezer to put in a stock and like the tops of the carrots, I like to save and the peels to save for my chicken stock or my, you know, whatever vegetable stock if I'm making it. So there's, yeah. We're going to have to do some cooking with Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to do some cooking. If anybody is interested, I am. I am. Let's do some cooking with Sarah. She does cooking classes. I do. Let's, I do. And we could have a whole lot of fun because your girl can't cook. 
well at all. So we'll, mm-hmm. we'll trust me, it'll be fun just helping me along. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, Sarah, tell everybody where you are on Instagram so they can follow you. We got your website up. Tell everybody how they can follow you. Uh, so yeah, on Instagram, I'm the Fry Bread Riot. And um, that's really, I'm the worst about social media. So. <laughs> I also have a group on Facebook called the Fry Bread Riot and where I will, you know, we can have discussions about foods and you can ask questions anywhere you can find me. I'm on Twitter at the Fry Bread Riot also. So wherever you find me, if you have questions, feel free to ask. And if I don't know, then I will find somebody who does. Yay. Well, I'm excited. Again, Georgia is an agriculture state. I am determined. I am sitting on that agriculture committee. I'm going to get, I'm going to be so well versed because food, you know, we have to get it right. You know, this is, this is our lifeline. This is the key to health to me is healthy eating to me is the key to, to, to healthy living and a healthy life. So I agree. Yes. Thank you for being my guest today, Sarah. I have totally (laughs) enjoyed you. I'm, I'm going to learn more and we're going to continue to stay connected. Sounds good. Yes. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll put you in the backdrop. Hold on for me. All right. Bye. All right, y'all. This was great. We're going to continue to have these kind of conversations. Again, Georgia is an agriculture state. We got to make sure that we are feeding America because I know we can do it. I'll see you next week, everybody. to Washington in this campaign, we're coming to get our check. Reparations, Martin said we coming for our check. Reparations, say it loud, one, two, my check. Green, cash rules, everything around me. Green. My legacy, you can't stop me. Coming for our 40 acres, ain't y'all 40 and our paper. Kicking the door, coming for our 40 acres and more. Our 6.4 trillion. No, we fought the civil war. We came from the poor. Stop on the bottom, we still on the floor. We pledge to the Lord. Amen. Picking the cotton, our fingers are sore. Straight out the underground, scared from slavery. The only cemetery that we had were the trees. Watching our bodies while they glow in the breeze. Think to the north side, I used to get free. Get out. That, that way, way. came from slavery. Where's all the man wants to stay on me? Put her head on the door, but the world won't see. Think to the north side, I used to get free. Reparations, Martin said we coming for our check. Reparations, say it loud. One, two, my. Step and try Remy chemical read. If it happened to them, think.